Child abuse is a pervasive problem that affects millions of children around the world. According to the World Health Organization, as many as one in four children experience physical abuse, one in five girls, one in 13 boys experience sexual abuse. These statistics highlight the urgent need for action to prevent child abuse and protect children from harm. Child welfare programs and services play a critical role in this effort, providing support for children and their families and promoting well-being of the children. Child protection is the safeguarding of children from violence, exploitation, abuse, neglect. It involves identifying signs of potential harm, responding to allegations or suspicions of abuse, providing support and services to protect children and holding those accountable who have harmed them. The goal of child protection and welfare are to ensure that children have access to quality health care, education and other basic amenities. Additionally, child protection and welfare efforts aim to promoting children emotional, social and cognitive development in order to help them grow into healthy, happy and productive adolescents and adults. Ultimately, the goal is to create a society where children are able to reach their full potentials. In order to achieve this goal, child protection services must be provided in a holistic way. This means to take into account social, economical, cultural, psychological and environmental factors that can contribute to the risks of harming children and their families. This also requires collaborative measures across various sectors and disciplines to create a comprehensive system of support and safety for the children. It is the responsibility of individuals, organizations and governments to ensure that children are protected from harm and their rights are respected. Now I'll be passing the baton to Chidema and Victoria as they do justice to this topic with the guests in the studio. You're welcome back to the show and if you're just joining us, you're right on time because the show is just about to begin. Thank you so much, Hope, for that insightful session. And um, like Hope rightly said, we're going to be discussing something today about child protection and welfare. And this is of utmost importance to us because... You know, they always attribute it to the women are the ones that take care of the children. And anything that affects the woman, we discuss it on the show. Mm. And we're going to be doing that discussion today with our guest in the studio. His name is Ifai Ofondo. He's a social justice and a youth advocate. You're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to have you join us. I know Pose Agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, okay, now let's go straight to our topic of discussion, which is child protection and welfare. Yeah. Well, um, for me, I, I, I saw the topic on social media and I saw so many people having their opinion about it. I want to know why should we discuss this topic? Why is it important for us to discuss child protection and welfare? Thank you very much. Um, it's extremely important mm. because child protection and child welfare is the very existence okay. of human being. Because when mm. we grow, children are the ones that take over. In every generation, that is why we have generation. That is why you see, they say decade. Now, in a decade, there's a particular de demographic dividend that clears away. It is that child that becomes an adult. So child protection and child welfare is like the very existence of children. And it's something that is extremely important, something that we should care about. So I'm very happy that we're having this discussion today. And I believe that we'll do justice to the discussion. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Um, at what age, though, uh, is it important to start discussing about child um, protection? I think the moment a child is born, yeah. the moment a child is born to this world, you have to start protecting that child. To the very uh, age we believe that uh, it's now an adult age, yeah. which is 18. <coughs> but even at that 18 parents some parents still some societies still make sure that you are you have everything you need mm. as a child so i believe that we have to start laying down every important thing mm. a child needs mm. the very moment that child is at home okay holistically you'll be speaking about protection you'll be saying protection protection so but what does it entail let's look at it holistically what does child protection entails okay perfect uh this question leads me to what we call child safeguarding, mm. child uh, like kind of uh, building a block of safety, of okay. security, and the child is in the middle. Mm. So when you talk about child protection, you're talking about protecting this child from basic things of the society, harmful basic things of the society. For example, like child abuse, we're talking about... Uh, Gender-based violence can be an, a very, very dear 
mm. consequences of child protection mm. and we are even looking at different uh, child protection even cyberbullying where we know the internet age now you know children are on the internet they see so much a lot of things mm. on the internet mm. and so when you talk about child protection is basically removing harm from these ch children from every single child out there no matter the age no matter the level no matter the gender it is an important uh, mm. topic mm. that we should handle and i'm happy that we're talking about this because i believe that the new administration mm. can gain a lot of insight from this discussion mm. to better plan yes. okay now let's um understand when we're talking about child protection and welfare are we only attributing it to maybe the less privileged or is it generally for every children for every single child out there child protection is very dear to the richest uh, man's child out there mm. okay. because there is a, like when you go to my twitter page uh, the first pinned tweet you see is where i talked about the value of african charter on children mm. and then uh, i think is there is a, a cartoon where you have the cycle of a child's life where the child grows up then in that cartoon is trying to explain that if a child is living recklessly from bed the child is on the street mm. the child has no guidance no protection mm. at the end of the day in the cartoon we're seeing the child being a powerful person in the society and acting like a dog somebody that is meant to guide to society mm. acting totally so that is an example of child protection mm. it crosses across every region mm. every space every gender every tribe every nook and cranny even if you're in the vulnerable society even if you're in the top channel even if your parents are low income earners even if your parents are the richest people in town child protection policies child protection guidelines should apply to that child okay yes my question begging yeah. in mind is um want to know who is um, responsible for child protection okay because i believe when we were growing i don't know perhaps maybe the literary definition um they said um, a, 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 the parents of a child are not the sole responsibility uh, responsible for training mm. that child because it's even the neighbors mm -hmm. are involved. So I would love to ask, when, since we were talking about protection of a child, who is responsible? Okay, that is another beautiful question. Do you know why? Because this leaves us in different tiers of that channel mm. of protection. The first tier is the family, where this child is known, where this child comes from where this child first grows up from mm. then after the family you get to the tier of the community where this child is going to relate be around the uh, so, uh friends school you know it begins the community is mm. entirely Very around this so. child yes then the third layer is now the government mm. so we have the government the community and the family so every policy every guideline should be groomed right from the family to the community then to the government so what government does is to reg regulate government regulates this the ones that they can regulate through mm. policies now the family implements the community implements so this this is the kind of channel we're looking at mm. okay now i want us to go into details now okay. what are those harmful practices that people carry out on children that requires child protection and welfare this is something that uh, has been uh, beckoned on at the UN level, mm. UNICEF, WHO, uh, even at the government level, Ministry of Women Affairs and Ministry of Health. Half of practices is a very dear problem we face in our current society. And when we talk about harmful practices, we, we are looking at traditional practices that are harmful to the individual being uh, afflicted with. So we are looking at child marriage. Okay which is a major harmful practice. And we're also looking at female genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. this both, these both cases are mostly, you know, targeted at the uh, girl child, but it also affects the male child, like child marriage. A male child can be an, a, a, like, can experience child marriage. So when we talk about harmful practices, it's something that should and must be eliminated because this is something that uh, the UN family have sat down done research on seen statistics that shows that this is not causing any good 
to the development, the social development of the society. Rather, it is diminishing. It is taken away from us, just like female genital mutilation, which is a very dear case in the southwest and in the south uh, east. Mm -hmm. And at the U uh, UNICEF level, UNICEF Nigeria, we recently launched a program called Movement for Good to end female genital mutilation, where we want to get all the society to be part of ending these harmful practices. So I'm happy you brought these harmful practices up because it's something that people really need to start looking at. We are in an age whereby people ask questions. Things that happen just don't happen anymore. You need to find what is the social problem consequences of this case so we're talking about female genital mutilation is destroying a lot of families now a lot of girls can't even give birth because of that fga and we look at child marriage child marriage is even the worst one of the biggest cases of fessler disease amongst women is child marriage is caused by child marriage so you see that harmful practices is a key component mm. when we talk about child protection because once your parents from the family level eliminates that harmful practices that child is shocked of you are we are going to grow up to be a big girl to be whoever you want without being somebody's puppet as a child uh, bride two you get not to decide what you do with your you get to decide what you do with your body if you want to cut yourself that is your decision but that shouldn't be inflicted to you mm. at birth so that is the child protection we're talking about okay let me quickly ask that. i want us to relate this context we're discussing to our society mm -hmm. um protection of a child you you named three tiers you said um if i got your community yes, parent yes. a family, family community and government yes now relating to our society do you think uh in your op own opinion that there are no lapses or they are filling in should i say there's a success rate when it comes to parents protecting their children when it comes to the community when it comes to the government do you think they have been able to protect the children successfully or are there gaps that need to be filled? Um, I also want to really another question mm. relating to this okay. too. Um, the issue of al Majori, for instance, you mm. made mention of uh, early child marriage mm. as one of the issues. Mm. Then I know al Majori, it's a system in w Islamic mm. school in the north. Mm. However, there's this um, kind of um, background of it where uh, the children are being sent out to beg and the rest. So it has become a problem. Mm. So begging, for instance, do you mm. think is also an issue that needs to be uh, addressed. addressed perfectly mm. starting from the quest uh, the first question mm. there are lots of gap we are looking at a lot of vacuum hole because when we talk about the community the family then the government starting from the community mm. most child abuse cases you see a, a, a 32 year old man raping a five year old girl you know you see different type of cases all this happened at the community mm. all this happened within the family community unit and when you look at it you ask yourself why is such thing happening where are we failing can't such cases be limited to a certain extent that this has to end it mustn't has to continue and you look at the regulations the police enforcement uh, laws on this and sometimes people are, uh, cry about that they take these cases to the police station and nothing happens it dies right after the, mm. uh, the, the report is given yes it shouldn't be so the success the, the rate of this uh, intervention is really low mm. because we are still seeing cases of cases of children being abused children that are left for harmful practices children that are experiencing child labor children that are experiencing a lot of harm now this is in this family and community unit mm. now let us believe that in some cases these children that are in low income earners uh, families and you know their parents can't really afford anything for them and they get to the street and start hawking and start doing all sort of things now they are exposed to that child protection uh, child protection harms no, no child protection for them they are exposed people can pick them up in the road do what sort of things to them you know because nobody really cares nobody is guiding them and it shouldn't be so because the person that is meant to solve that problem is at the government level mm. 
The government level is the main person, the main entity, the main unit that is meant to intervene and make sure that what are the problems making that child hawk. Should you be hawking or should you be in school? That is the, the responsibility of the government. Mm. Make sure that these children are not out of school. That is the unit. Now, the family has failed. Mm. They have no money. The government now has to come in. That is for the first question. Mm. Then coming to the Amarjuri case. Uh, can I get a, the glimpse part of that Amarjuri case? The issue of begging. Of yes, the, the issue. Then thank you. Now we leave it to the child level. Begging. Poverty. Poverty is giving us a very big vacuum mm. on terrible things that are happening to children. You go to the north. You see, oh my God, you see uh, kids, children, youths that are uneducated. But that can, yes. but, but don't you think emphasis should be laid more on advocacy for um, um, the turn down of birth rates, especially in the corner than the protection itself? Because if it, the birth rate is not addressed, then there's no essence for protection if people are poor. Yes. Now, look at this. We're in a two way case here. In the case of uh, but we're talking about family planning. We're talking about uh, what is the government doing about family planning? What is the advocacy? Like you said, what is the voice on telling and educating these women and men mm. to give birth to children they can train? Mm -hmm. Now, you see in some cases, tradition is playing in. Tradition comes, a man marries three or four wife, and these three or four wife each has like four, four children. Then when each of these children, you see, are out on the streets with nothing, the father doesn't even care. He has no pain in him that his children are not in school. Mm. So you see, it's a two-way thing. It's in the family unit and also in the government unit. And now, what is the government doing about this emergency case? What are the policies in line to make sure that no single child out there, you have no right to come to the society and you just... You know, they bring you up to be a chaos. You enter okay, the sorry, armed forces. Uh, you. Yeah. I don't know if it's because of our set of where we're in Nigeria. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, clearly, most of the time, we call on the government to do some mm -hmm. things for us. And sometimes, they don't show up. So, we end up doing it ourselves. Yeah. Now, I want to ask a question. You'll be talking about um, government. The government should do this. But don't you think... you? I know you mentioned the family. Mm -hmm. But don't you think it's something that is lack of parental responsibility because starting from the fact what Victoria rightly mentioned here about mm. people giving birth to children that they can't take care of mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that mm -hmm. too right yeah. don't you think it's something that should be addressed even if you say tradition comes in mm -hmm. these rules were made by us yes for us right yes. and it's something that we can say oh I don't want to do mm -hmm. don't you now think it's something that has to do with the mindset of the parents the people involved because clearly you say that you can't afford to cater for your first wife and children and you want to go on and take three or four and in the name of um children's uh, children is a blessing from mm. a child is a blessing from god oh, right yes. and forgetting that god has also given you wisdom to know the number of children you should mm -hmm. give birth to and take care of so don't you think it starts with the parents first mm. and majorly lands on the parents before we get up to the government i, I will not entirely disagree with you i do not even disagree with you because you're saying the right thing the parents are the ones that have this responsibility because they are the ones causing the chaos and now when you look at the chaos you now look at how informed are these parents how literate are these parents do they even uh, believe that this is not the norm <laughs> that is where we have an issue some of them believe that this is the norm there is nothing wrong with it who has told them that this is not the norm who has told them that you are bringing children to suffer to cause more economic crisis nobody is really there to guide this so-called parents and now i think it is an important issue that we're talking about because this is something that is happening as we sit down right now yeah you true. go to the core not people are giving birth to children they cannot account for mm. and now taking responsibility they tell you that oh yeah, 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 that is not your business it's my child now we have to <laughs> shape our ways mm. to see how we make these parents this family know that the government like you said shouldn't even be the government is secondary 
and when I was defining the stages, the family is the first. Yeah. So if that family, if that father, if that mother is okay marrying that child at the age of 13, mm. out for marriage, she or he should face the law enforcement. Mm. If that parent is happy because you cannot fend for the family and you send your children out for child labor, you should account for that. And that is when I still mention the government. Because whoever that is going to tell you that is wrong is the government. They are the ones that will tell you that you do this, this is the consequences. Any child that is married in the north, this is the consequences. We start with the father, then we enter the mother. Mm. Any child we see hawking, this is the consequences. Mm. Now you see that the ideology begins to change. Okay, now you, you spoke about um, maybe illiteracy or something. Yeah. Now it goes on to the level of education mm -hmm. or how exposed people are or sensitization. Yes. I know a lot of groups have been sensitizing a lot, mm -hmm. trying, I know a whole lot. This is a female show. Yeah. So we always talk about educate the girl child, educate children, let them go to school, give them the freedom to do what they want to yes. do. If they grow up and say, I don't want to go to school again, mm -hmm. I want to end up in the kitchen, it should be up to them. Mm -hmm. So now, how, how well do you think we have come up with the, um, with the level of education that we give our children these days? Are you, do you think that um, parents have been that enlightened to know that education is a major factor? Because even as we're speaking now, we had a guest sometime, I think last week, and she was mentioning the fact that a, par a mother told her, that she her daughter can't go to school because mm -hmm. there's no point of the child going to school wow it's a rather we have fun just like it happens in those days mm -hmm. they rather go we make money the more our money is the most important thing we, we need in life yeah. so if we start making money from a tender it is even better for for us than how going to waste money in school mm -hmm. we still have people with that kind of mentality yeah. so how well or how far have we gone with our sensitization do you think our sensitization and advocacy is really mm -hmm. working out or should we try another method um i will start with uh changing behavioral norm is not something you do once mm -hmm. and let it go it is a constant thing now our sensitization is not enough because when we come to the sensitization and advocacy the people i'm seeing leading this is the cso's the ngos they are the ones that are on the back of this okay. preaching going to the grassroots talking to parents that this is how many people can they reach mm. now we need to decentralize this sensitization to change behavioral norm because what we are trying to achieve is the total change of behavioral norm and that is when you can see a parent mm -hmm. informed knows the value of education and will not have such ideology that you send your children to farming that your life will not be better your your family has every chance of being in generational poverty you know what there's something we call generational poverty yeah when the children even get to start something years and the mother is like 60 or 70 you people are still in poverty mm. that is generational poverty nobody is <laughs> breaking the curse nobody is breaking the chain so when we start with our sensitization, which is not enough, mm -hmm. I think this is where we need everybody on board. Mm. Looking at the local media, down to that local man and woman in the language they understand that this is not right. This is what you should do. CSOs cannot do it alone. Okay. They need all parties on board. They need all agents of the society on board. Sometimes agents of the society include the private sector. It includes those people that, even if it's people that are selling uh, uh, tissue, mm. they can't do, involve in this sensitization we are talking about. Private sector should keep coming in. They need to understand that this is a collective responsibility for everybody to make sure that no single child out there is left to, you know, suffer so much. So, like you have said, the sensitization is there we are trying this is part of it mm -hmm. we can only but do our best okay uh, uh, sorry I'll, vicky okay. i think the corner needs to go on the break right, now yes. okay viewers we'll be going on a short break and when we return and gender continues we'll be right back Welcome back. If you're just joining us, it's still the agenda. Uh, we've had our guests um, in the first half discussing uh, child um, protection and child 
welfare. And before we went on that, Baxter, he said something about decentralizing the, the system. I know you've said that um, parents have their role to play, community have their role to play, government have their role to play. And I can tell you for a fact that as much as um, we feel that um, we still feel like the government have to do more, the government are also trying. Mm -hmm. Because in the instance of Hawking, I remember in Kaduna State, uh, um, Nashua Elbufai at some point and um, said that all, all children must go back to school. Mm -hmm. And then he made sure even his son mm -hmm. went to public school. Mm -hmm. And then he said he didn't want to su see any children hawking. And the, the community said, um, why will our children not hawk when there is no food? They need to get food. They need to fend for themselves. And also for, we have mm -hmm. to fend for the family. And he said, okay, there will be food in schools. Mm -hmm. And he went on to do it. But yet we still see people hawking. Do mm -hmm. you think, um, because it starts first of all with the mm -hmm. family, I'm still emphasizing this, the fact that parents will not stop giving birth to children they mm -hmm. cannot take care of. And then it ends with the family, the fact that these same parents do not want to get, I'm sure you said that there's an, a lot of sensitization ongoing, yeah. but they are, it's more like rebuking the sensitization, like it's not how, it's not the way we do things, there's yeah, a we norm we have to. Mm -hmm. Don't you think... Um, I don't know. Perhaps there is still more to be done, especially with the parents. The parents here. The parents. Yes. Um, let me share a story mm. okay. of um, when we were at the field uh, in Imo State. So um, there was a particular family that I met and uh, the child, it was a young girl. She was, uh, you know, helping to prepare Akara and all this bread and everything. So, and it was a normal daytime where they should be in school. Mm. So I was like, uh, uh mama, why is your child not in school? Why is she here? She should be in school. She's a very young girl. She should join others. She's like, ah, no, this one young girl. No, she has good though. That she has to stay back and help mm. in the family. If not that her, she doesn't have the strength mm. to feed. That after all, what is the government doing for her? Mm. That is how she ended it. So at, I, I looked at the young girl. I, I thought to myself, she doesn't even know what's going on with her life. Mm. She doesn't know how this will affect her in the next 10 years mm -hmm. to come. And the mother is definitely not informed mm. on what, to happen, uh, what will happen in, uh, to this girl. And when you look at uh, studies, you, you see out of school children, the number is terrible. Yeah, mm. it's high. Like you see, the, the, it's, it's so like it's chiroting. So you now ask yourself, is it that these children or these parents don't even care? for the future of their child and some of these parents will tell that they are left with no other option why it comes back to poverty mm. it comes back to unemployment rate social political problems everything that we are facing conflict everything that is around the society if i mention is talking about poverty are we talking about poverty as in financial poverty or of the mind mental poverty, or mental poverty. Both. because <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about poverty yes trust me, there, I know of some um, people, we had mm -hmm. experience, we went to school, we met people that their parents are not even financially okay to send them to school, but they still strive mm. yes. to bring. So don't you think it's more or less mental poverty? Like Because I, I always say this, that I've been to um, the vulnerable places yeah. home, and they've brought education to their doorstep, mm -hmm. but still some of them reject education. Okay. Because of the, I think because yeah. of their mindset, mm. you hear a parent <coughs> say something like, "I don't want my daughter to go to school. Mm. They are partial in that school. Like, mm. what's your business with partiality in the school you get?" So sometimes, uh, when we talk about poverty, should mm. we should I think we should be specific. Is it financial yes. poverty now or mental poverty? Okay, so I will start with financial poverty. Mm. That is the number one driver we have seen on the field. Whoever you talk to, they'll tell you that ah, I don't uh, enable a way may go. I don't have money. money to send my daughter or my son to school mm. and you'll be like okay what if we sponsor her or he they'll say okay and that is why you see some scholarship nobody rejects it mm -hmm. the parents don't reject it they accept it full-heartedly it's only but a few that are still attached to that you know cultural or let me not even say cultural but that uh, i don't know as historical mentality okay that is uh, for generations that we don't nobody has been going to school we farm we are farmers what are we doing with this white collar job after all school has come mm -hmm. yeah that's a quote oh, that's a slang you understand so 
but when we look at the first layer the most popular one the most you know talked about one is that financial poverty, poverty. where we believe that some school systems are not even free and when you look at some children that actually go to school now they go to primary he ends there secondary is not in the picture some now goes to secondary then that is where the mentality poverty also comes in where your parents now tell you that yes you have reached the secondary level it's enough meaning the one that you have read is okay so you see that that is where the mentality poverty comes in what about the university level because is that university level that will make that person mold that person into what he or she should be then i will not forget the fact that people also believe in skills okay. it's mostly noticed in the southeast in for my education yes it's mostly noticed in the southeast and what how do we argue about that aspect also because if you come to the southeast some people believe that their children should go and learn trade mm. yeah should go and learn mechanic for boys the Girls go and learn, yes system. apprenticeship yeah. system skill acquisition mm -hmm. That they believe that it is better you enter immediately to financial uh, background. Now we leads us to poverty. Okay, now if we're talking about this apprenticeship method mm -hmm. now and children going to get a skill, let's go to another form again that uh, a contributing factor why mm -hmm. we need to discuss child protection, which is mm -hmm. child abuse. Mm -hmm. I know that earlier, um, sometime I think last year, mm -hmm. there was a particular presenter that was called out. I think a radio presenter was called out for. I think he slapped a woman because oh. she has a um she picked up a girl mm -hmm. and took her in as a help i think mm -hmm. and then she w she was maltreating the girl she did something either she inflicted some form of injury on her and refused to treat her and eventually her body parts was kind of um decaying and rotting oh and when God. he finally saw her he was pissed and he asked what happened and the woman said she's possessed and she's a witch and he asked, what made you, uh, why, why are you so sure that she's a witch? She couldn't give a country, concrete answer and he slapped her out of anger. Yes. Because he, he, in, his, in his defense, nobody has the right to inflict that kind of injury to a child. Yes. Now, in this process of, of apprenticeship, we get to see some vulnerable children. Mm -hmm. You, maybe their parents say, I've given birth to these children mm -hmm. and I can't afford to mm -hmm. take care of them so mm -hmm. they should go and learn something somewhere mm -hmm. sometimes these vulnerable people come maybe as a result of war conflict talk about yeah. the idp yes people in the idp vulnerable mm -hmm. homes and stuff like that now if we have those kind of children amongst us mm -hmm. and people try to help them and in the process of helping them they take advantage of them and inflict injury on them and mm -hmm. abuse them how should the government come into this because so many of this is happening and like everywhere mm -hmm. It's happening in your next door. The next oh, yeah. door. Just like personally in mm -hmm. Lagos where, where I used to live. The next person beside you, you just hear that she puts pepper in her eyes. You hear things like she puts mm -hmm. um, pepper in her genitals mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Because she says she's trying to train her up and correct her for the mistake that she made. Mm -hmm. Now, how are we going to fight this? Nobody's saying anything about it. Children are going through this. I've had people, friends mm -hmm. that tell me, uh, my mom puts pepper in my genitals when I was growing up. And I'm like, how, why? But it was a norm to them. They yeah. didn't see it as anything. So that is another form of maltreatment mm -hmm. to children. So how do we fight this? How does the government come in? How do the policymakers come in, the CSOs? How do we fight this? Thank you very much. Now, when I was mentioning earlier, the different sections that we need to look at mm -hmm. child justice this okay. is the part that we are going to be stressing on with this maltreatment case now when you look at the child justice system it needs to be strengthened it needs to be acted upon so what are we talking about when we talk about child justice we're talking about the legal and total justice system protecting the child for example a slap to any child should be answerable to court that mm. is an assault <laughs> yes it's but is the parents that is the thing because this is who we are okay but now when you step over the line mm. that is when the system needs to act and even if you don't step over the line and mm. eventually that child reports you the system needs to act the neighbor sieges no, are who are we reporting to in Nigeria? That is the police force. That is the Would they take us seriously? Yes. That is it. They have to. 
because it's enshrined in our constitution there is a child mm. act that is there that is backing the protection of every venerable child out mm. there it is there they are there so who should enforce this the court and the police and when you look at we also need to be informed because people doing that to their children and your neighbor will see your child screaming hey whoa hey whoa i'm about to die you and your neighbor doesn't say anything <laughs> doesn't come to your door and knock and say please stop this is wrong you see that there's still misinformation people feel that is a norm till the child dies or till it goes viral <laughs> because one thing in nigeria is you never know what is happening mm -hmm. at the background till it goes viral oh. So if we only wait for it to go viral, then do you know how many children that are dying silent, silently under the, the aspects of house help, mm. maltreatment, ironing. They, they, there's one that I, I saw, they used iron to, to lay on the girl's uh, breast. And you ask yourself, what is this? How can you be so cruel and wicked? Now she feels that she's going to go free because there's no justice system fighting her. There is nobody close to her that is going to fight this. So it's when it goes viral, everybody start cursing. Mm. The local division, police division, it will swipe immediately. What are the surveillance system already setting? We need to have a surveillance system that is going to tell us that this child, this person, if you are abused, you will be reported immediately. It should be domiciled in the system. It shouldn't even be something that should be messed around with. Okay, you you said about mm. uh, you spoke about justice system. Mm. Perhaps um, maybe we should um, if something like that mm. is passed on, there should be a balance because I know sometimes like in this society we live, it's kind of free um, from um, discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay, so perhaps maybe a balance from when a child is being disciplined yes. and when a child maltreated. is being maltreated should uh, be made. However. Or I'll be it. I feel um, parents, I'm still emphasizing on mm. parents now, um, tend to like, they, they, they go scot free in so many um, matters. Okay, for instance, mm. let's say a child is raped and the rest, and sometimes the, the society will blame where, where was the mother, where was the father when that child was being raped or mm -hmm. abused by a neighbor or something. Mm. So, help us understand what's, how should parents? Uh, be involved in the day-to-day -day activity of their children to avoid or to to preempt uh, pre protection for that child okay thank you very much i'm going to lay on two things and emphasize on two important things one is negligence mm. then the second one is the relationship mm. a parent has with a child you see that some children and some family your mother or your father will be noticing what is happening around their child mm -hmm. but because of negligence they will not care mm -hmm. to pay more attention they need to work they need to do this they need to do that so because of that you're neglecting mm -hmm. the basic needs of that child which is you as a parent to pay attention and that is leaving us to information then also relationship you see cases of children there was a case uh, we saw uh, lately where a child was raped for, I think, three years. Mm -hmm. That particular neighbor mm -hmm. kept on raping her. Kept on raping her. Your, your mother, your father, nobody knows. Because, look, she has gotten to the age that nobody bates her, nobody looks at her. Mm -hmm. But you cannot talk because you have not established that motherly and child relationship where you not tell your mother something and she will use backhand i say are you mad that is the misinformation that is the law of the communication the training that a lot of parents needs to know that sometimes you need to sit down even if the child is 15 16 call your child together what is happening to you are you okay communicate with your child it mustn't be always you know hush hush you know there are some things that happens at the family unit that sometimes we call discipline but it is not discipline we're pushing our children away from us there is a way you will treat your child if you see matured discipline you don't even need to beat the child just a, a look <laughs> or a word 
will make the child arrange. Now that child has your respect and love. That child will come to you if anything happens. But there is this fear when we have seen cases of child abuse and we end up with, why didn't you tell your mother? Why didn't you tell your father? Do you know what these children say? My mother would beat me. Mm -hmm. So why would you think that your mother would beat you when somebody has abused you? Mm. Do you see where we come to that relationship? Mm. If the relationship of gentle, kindness, love is there and the confidence is installed in that child and you, the child is informed that if you touch me in some certain places of my body, it is wrong. That is when you see that such of these cases will be out there. Then the parents can act. But when the fear is there, the child will close up. I wonder why it's uh, actually um, for stressed on the mother. The mother is supposed to do this. this the mother is supposed to do that. Like you said, mother, mother, um, mother, mother, <laughs> mother, four times. Like, where's the role? What role does the father play? Where is he? The father, the father, father plays a very important role. Mm. And I must not deny that. The father plays an important role. The father is the armor of every household. You are the armor, meaning that you are the shield. You're protecting your child. You're protecting your wife. So now, why I, I, I used to mention mother. Mm. Not just you. Everybody. Well, yeah, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> why I'm mentioning mothers first is because they are the number one unit to every child from, from birth. Starting from the breast milk. In fact, in the delivery, the child and the mother has bonded. Mm. Now the father is just there bring it in with the love yeah. now when every home grows the child grows anything that happens is always the mother because the mother is that person that has been with this child nurturing this child the, the, so do you know there are some families that the the children see their father like once in a week yeah. or some don't even see in a month so you see the very first unit is the mother but that doesn't define that or that doesn't justify that a father doesn't oh, that a, a father is not responsible for any you know negligence in the home a father should also be there to observe your children love your children be friendly with your children we should remove and kill that custom of that is back everybody will run that is in some cases people feel that is respect but in some cases is fear people children are not friendly with their father they feel that their father is too harsh the father is too that shouldn't be the norm you know sometimes when i read books and i read uh, i see things that are happening in the western world i used to ask myself these are different people that are trained differently from this orientation we have our own orientation and probably your father didn't even talk to his own father when he was growing mm -hmm. so you feel that yes that is what should be the norm that is not so father should be so you know father should take father should even nurture their children like the mother understand your children sometimes you have your the child will not be able to tell the mother some certain things it's you that is the father and when it comes to the male issue of child protection and child abuse sometimes it's being perpetrated by male and when this happens, it, it is traced back to their home. You see that male boys are not, you know, groomed properly. Mm. Positive masculinity, that is what we call it at the UN level. Male boys are not groomed. They are not taught mm. on how to behave, on how to treat a woman, on how to seek consent. And it's the responsibility of the father to do that from this tender age. Mm. You get your male sons and even your female children closer and teach them respect consent these are the things you should and shouldn't do you know i think what you're talking about yeah. and i think it's even beginning to change because i hear of women give experiences where um you know everybody wants to jump the japa syndrome and men are men husband and wife are traveling out and the mm. men have to stay back and take care of the children while the woman goes to work for example she's a nurse and yeah. she's the one making the money mm. so the narrative is changing actually mm. but as we round up now I'd like you have your thoughts on this final one i saw somewhere that says that um a malnourished child is actually being deprived of his or her rights as a child mm -hmm. like it's also something a challenging factor that makes us discuss child yeah. protection and welfare so um sometimes it happens as a form of um the people say is um health condition but should we really blame the parents for a malnourished child yes 
we should blame both the parents, the system, the condition of life. We should blame everything blameable. Mm -hmm. Because a child shouldn't and mustn't be malnourished. Malnutrition is not is no joke. <laughs> I was in some part of a bunny. In one, uh, I think it's, I don't know the particular LG again. And I saw this malnourished child. My heart skipped. Because this child is like, you know, as if nobody cares about you. And that gets us to zero hunger. Mm -hmm. Zero hunger, which leads us to SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Goals. So now, why are these children hungry? Why are you allowing a child of four, three, two years to be malnourished? So the child has started suffering right from bed. And I will not keep jumping from this part. Malnourishment is one of the genesis is poverty. And I will not I will lie to you on this. Because study has shown that these parents, when we go to the north and ask them, and we check the child with the malnourish uh, gauge, and we'll be like, oh, why are you not giving this child proper nutrient? I say, ah, I don't have money. That I just, we can only feed once in a day. And things are so expensive now. Inflation is up and down. So you see that poverty is one of the major. That is why poverty is even number one. No poverty are the sustainable development goals. Because we have traced that majority of the 80%, 90% problem faced is poverty. Now, it leads us to, at the African Union level, we are uh, doing a lot of food systems. Uh, they are doing a lot of uh, food strengthening, nutrition. And you look at these are informations that parents should know. There are certain nutrients you should give your child, mm -hmm. even if you don't have money. There are certain nutrients. You don't go and feed a, a, a tender child, Gary, maybe Gary in the morning, mm -hmm. Gary in the afternoon, mm -hmm. Gary at night. <laughs> he turns to wash <laughs> up. You see? <laughs> you see? There's, so these are the problems mm -hmm. that we're facing. So both poverty, misinformation, and a total, you know, it, it should be very, very important that we actually should start acting. Even the government. No child should be malnourished. And do you know that malnourishment doesn't leave you? Yeah. That is the major cause of stunted growth. Mm. Oh, wow. And stunted growth leads you to whatever age you are going to leave this world. You see some people that are very small. A woman of like 58, extremely small. You know there's a difference between being short and that you are small. Your small is that you are slim, then tiny. So it's not genetical conditions. Mm. It's the way they grew up. Mm -hmm. It's the malnourishment. So this leads to the Ministry of Agriculture. Ministry of, you know, there's this school feeding program that is aiming to end malnourishment mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. That when children come to school, they feed, they feed them. them. Okay, thank you so much for the time. Thank, thank you. you. Jane. Thank you. You've mentioned a lot of advocacy, sensitization, CSOs. People are doing a lot. And I think at this point, please, in, in you know, when the Bible says, don't just be hearers, but doers of the word. Let's not just be hearers. Let's also practice what we are learning. Some people hear it and it falls to deaf ears. Send your girl child to school. Send your children to school. Take proper care of your children. If you're with somebody's child and if the person is not your blood, you don't have to maltreat the child. Mm -hmm. Know that every child has a right. You should protect the child. The welfare of the child is very important. Make sure that your children, because there's something you used to say, and I would like you to put it. I think you used to say something about when you train up, when you bring up a child well. That's the way the society becomes. Exactly, and it affects the nation at large. Please, that's all we can take on today's episode of Engender. Do well to join us next time on another episode. I remain Chidi Mao from Madura. Well, uh, give birth to children you can fend for. I am Victoria Agbi. Until next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye.